What up guys, Golson here for Anime Uproar and today we are going to be going over every disaster level dragon and god monster in One Punch Man and their powers. I'm especially excited for this one because the villains always have the best backstories. Just so you know, the levels are as follows from weakest to strongest. Wolf, Tiger, Demon, Dragon and God. So in this video we are going to be discussing all the strongest villains including villains that could even be considered god level threats. But before we get into that, make sure to smash that like button if you like seeing One Punch Man videos on this channel. If you haven't be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you actually get notified when new videos drop. In this video there will be some manga and webcomic spoilers, you've been warned. Now without further ado let's look at the most powerful monsters in the world of One Punch Man. So, what does it mean to be categorized as disaster level dragon anyways? Well, disaster level dragon is reserved for monsters or other things that pose a threat to multiple cities, while disaster level god monsters pose a threat to the survival of humanity in general. First off, we have Vaccine Man aka Purple Piccolo. He exists because of humankind's constant pollution of the environment. He believes that the earth is a single living organism and humans are the germs that are killing it. In his view, the will of the earth gave birth to him so that he could destroy humanity. Usually you might think that a hero for fun wouldn't stand a chance against someone with such a well developed purpose. And yet the hero for fun kills him with one punch. So much for the earth's apostle. Vaccine Man can fly, shoot energy balls and transform, like he really is straight out of Dragon Ball Z. However, he definitely didn't have as much staying power as regular Piccolo. Next we have Carnage Kanuto, the giant bug man. His shell is said to be an impenetrable fortress. He was the House of Evolution's strongest creation. In physical traits and intelligence, he far surpassed the human race. At the time, Genos was completely outmatched by the monster. His breath alone could overpower one of Genos' strongest attacks. All of this got Saitama excited to fight. Carnage starts out brimming with confidence, but just as he's going to hit Saitama, he jumps back sensing that Saitama would have killed him if he didn't. He gets credit for sensing Saitama's true power at the very least. But then, Carnage goes full Evangelion mode and musters up all of his power to attack Saitama. Saitama panics, but only because he remembers that it's Saturday and that he's missing great deals at the supermarket. He finishes the buff pinnacle of human science with a simple absent-minded punch, causing Dr. Genus to say that he's done with experiments. Next we have Melzargard, probably the most freaky looking character in the entire series. He was a general in Boris's alien army. Melzar Guards' entrance is pretty dope. He easily kills the Sky King by swatting him like a gnat. He can regenerate from sword cuts like it's nothing. Unfortunately we can't say the same for the medieval armor Samurai who permanently loses his left arm to this dragon level creature. Melzar Guard can split up into 5 bodies or combine them all for max strength and damage. The way to kill him is to find the 5 orbs in his body and destroy them. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack while that haystack is trying to kill you. Another really cool power is his shapeshifting that allows him to grow wings or even weapons. It took the combined efforts of S-class heroes like Silver Fang, Metal Bat, Puri Puri Prisoner, Atomic Samurai, and even Tatsumaki to defeat this ever regenerating beast. Next we have Groribas, the thing with jaws for hands. It can release acid breath that can melt you. However, he only has time to let Saitama know that he's going to release his deadly acid breath attack before Saitama effortlessly punches his head off. At least Saitama waited for him to finish talking. Next we have Geryugan Shoop, the right hand alien man of Boros. He has octopus like tentacles. He claims to be the strongest psychic in the universe and can use psychokinesis to eliminate the friction between objects and air so the objects like rocks can attain insane speeds without evaporating. Not even best girl Tatsumaki can do that. The psychic alien octopus sends countless rocks at Saitama without doing any damage. Then the hero for fun throws one back and it immediately kills the so called strongest psychic in the universe. Next we have the superior to the previously mentioned aliens, Boros, the alien super saiyan himself. He also calls himself the dominator of the universe. The creator of One Punch Man, One, has said that Boros is beyond dragon level, but he hasn't officially been characterized as god either, meaning he could be somewhere in between dragon and god. In truth, 
he probably should be considered a god level threat because Boros said his finishing move would blow away the planet's surface, which would definitely be a threat to the survival of humanity in general. Boros is a lot like an alien version of Saitama. According to him, there was no one in the universe left for him to face, so he was bored. A seer had a prophecy 20 years ago that Boros could enjoy a challenging fight on Earth, so he came in the hopes of a worthy opponent. This time, one normal punch is not enough to kill Boros, just to destroy his armor that holds in his overwhelming power. His hair in each one of his transformations reflects a Super Saiyan form. First, it's like Super Saiyan, then Super Saiyan 2, and then the longer-haired Super Saiyan 3. He gets progressively stronger and faster, and his hits can launch Saitama all the way to the moon, even if they don't significantly hurt him. His species is supposed to be the greatest natural healing in the universe. He can recover from consecutive normal punches, which is unheard of up to this point. He can fire energy blasts like it's Dragon Ball Z. As mentioned, his final attack, which releases all his energy, can supposedly blow away the entire Earth's surface. Unfortunately for him though, Saitama manages to stop the attack and kill Boros with the air pressure from one of his serious punches. Boros definitely got the challenge he wished for, but Saitama had strength to spare. Next we have Bakuzan. Goketsu believes that Bakuzan is dragon level after his monster transformation. Bakuzan was a strong human martial artist, with a wild unibrow and very bushy sideburns. He chose to become a monster in order to become stronger. Instead of taking one monster cell, he takes a bunch. He eventually transforms and immediately becomes arrogant again. He even claims that he'll kill Goketsu if he gets in his way, although Goketsu quickly shows the gap between their strength. Then Bakuzan realizes that he doesn't need to be the strongest. He just likes to torment people weaker than him, like Suiru, who he used to envy when he was human. Luckily, Suiru gets rescued by Saitama, who effortlessly takes out half of Bakuzan's body, killing him in the process. Even before he took the monster cells, Bakuzan was referred to as the strongest man in the history of Super Fight. He used the martial arts style Dark Hell Assassination, which included cool moves like Bear Killer Mid Kick. He was known for ending fights in a brutal bloodbath. The monster cells greatly increased his already impressive physical abilities. However, his Dark Hell assassination style was no match for One Punch. Next, we have Elder Centipede. Definitely the strongest centipede I've ever seen. It towers over buildings when it comes to size. Its defense is also insane, since a pumped up metal bat, an S-Class hero, couldn't even crack its exoskeleton, nor could Metal Knight's missiles. It can cause mass destruction due to its strength and size, and it can quickly travel through the underground. It also has impressive regeneration abilities, since it could recover from Genos incinerating the inside of its body. Apparently Blast, the mysterious number one ranked S-Class hero, beat it two years ago, but he didn't succeed in killing the centipede, and it was even smaller then. So Elder Centipede comes back stronger than ever. Bang, his martial arts master brother Bomb, and Genos do not succeed in defeating it, but Saitama does with a glorious serious punch. It is impressive that Saitama resorted to using a serious punch to kill the Elder Centipede, but we have to remember, he wanted to minimize collateral damage, he wanted to make sure the Centipede didn't get away again, and he was frustrated about losing so many times to King in a video game earlier. So it was a way for him to blow off some steam. Thus, the Centipede that caused so much trouble for so many many S-Class heroes was nothing but a defective punching bag for Saitama. Next we have Phoenix Man who has one of my favorite backstories. He was just an actor who wore a bird costume and was the mascot of a show called Animal Empire. The character's name was Bird Brain. He was thick headed so he ended up dying all the time. He was the Chicken Kenny of the show, and he'd just be revived back in the next episode like nothing happened. The show ended up getting cancelled because there was so much dark humor. However, even after the show, the actor kept the suit on, and then underwent monsterfication with it, so he ended up inheriting the abilities of the fictional character from the show. Does it make sense? No. But is it entertaining? Definitely. As a result, when he's a monster, he can revive and he comes back even stronger. After Child Emperor defeats him the first time, he comes back as the dragon level Phoenix Man reincarnated, and he looks way cooler than he used to. As he said, enduring the hell that lies just short of death is the secret to making a monster undergo explosive growth. Which is true for Saiyans, and I'd argue for humans too. What doesn't kill you permanently, makes you stronger. Phoenix Man can now enter Hawk Mode and absorb energy-based attacks, and then release the energy he absorbed. 
his falcon mode allows him to fly even quicker than usual. After he resurrects for the second time, he enters the even more powerful Brilliant Eagle mode, the coolest looking form so far. At this point he's significantly more powerful, and he was already a dragon level threat before. Even a Super Kamehameha from Child Emperor, his strongest finishing attack, couldn't defeat him, although the power was so great that when Phoenix Man absorbed it, it caused defects in his mascot suit. Child Emperor clearly can't beat him in power, but he succeeds in beating him with a Tickle Tickle Bug number 1 that got inside the Phoenix suit and made it possible for Child Emperor to rip off the suit, which is the source of Phoenix Man's power. The fight between Child Emperor and Phoenix Man is one of my favorites, and I absolutely can't wait to see it animated. Goketsu had four eyes and he was an executive member of the Monster Association. He was a martial arts fighter and the winner of the first Super Fight Tournament. He was challenged and lost to the monster King Orochi. He was brought back to Monster Association HQ and eventually he was offered monster cells and went through the process of monsterization. He didn't want to have human limits anymore and he felt like becoming a monster was the way to break through those limits, gain greater power which would in turn allow him to take everything he wants using violence. He is stronger than ever after becoming a monster and is able to take out Genos with no problem. Goketsu can easily overpower Suiryu and even the dragon level monsterized Bakuzan. Goketsu's powers are straightforward. His monsterization enhanced his physical skills increasing his strength, durability and speed by insane amounts so that he can use his already impressive martial arts skills much more effectively. The great irony of Goketsu's life is that he became a monster to surpass human limits and then got one-shotted by a human. Next up we have Nyan, another executive member of the Monster Association. He is a cat man of sorts. He used to be a regular house cat, and he has PTSD because his owner, a little girl, used to force her love on him through hugs and kisses. He gained human-like intelligence when he underwent monsterization. He uses his impressive speed and sharp claws to fight. He could get deep cuts into Puri Puri prisoner's flesh before the latter developed body hair that drastically increased his defensive abilities. Additionally, Nyan can pass through cracks if they're more than 3 millimeters wide. He uses this ability to run away from Puri Puri prisoner. Although Nyan is not the strongest, he is smart and knows when to flee. For instance, he went full out and attacked Saitama from behind. It did nothing, and Nyan quickly quickly ran away from Saitama before he attacked him back. Thus, when he knows he's beat, he doesn't worry about pride, he just uses his impressive speed and passing through cracks ability to run away. Next we have Gyoro Gyoro, the eye monster with psychic abilities. It is said to be Orochi's closest advisor and the chief advisor of the Monster Association. In truth, Gyoro Gyoro is a meat puppet for the dragon level Esper, Third Eye Psychos who is actually the leader of the Monster Association and the old friend of Fubuki. She was actually the vice president of Fubuki's Blizzard group in high school. She saw a vision of the future that drove her mad. After seeing the future, she wanted to wipe out humanity. The Blizzard group and Psychos parted ways after that, and Psychos created the Monster Association with Orochi. She turned Orochi from a human into a monster and began to execute her plan. Psychos, aside from being able to evaluate a person's strength and turn them into powerful monsters, can use her impressive psychic abilities in battle. She can use psychic binding to suppress the power of another Esper and multiply the gravity in an area even by 300 times in order to crush her opponents. She can create psychic barriers to protect herself and or condense surrounding wreckage around her opponent in order to crush them. Nevertheless, she's no match for Tatsumaki, which is why she uses a number of dragon level monsters to give her brain damage so that Tatsumaki's psychic power becomes unstable temporarily. Unlucky for Psychos though, Fubuki shows up and even though she has less psychic output compared to Psychos, she succeeds in beating her by using her technique, Psychic Whirlwind, which makes Psychosis's attacks useful. Useless. Next up we have Orochi, the monster king himself. He used to be human but after countless failures and sacrifices he became the ultimate being according to Psychos. His power far exceeds that of most dragon level monsters. Orochi is a huge monster that dwarfs Saitama in size. He can produce many dragon heads and tentacles and use them to attack his enemies. He can shoot fire from dragon heads which is how he burns Saitama's cape. 
His ultimate form looks more human, but he still has Doc Ock-like limbs and dragon heads coming out all over his body. Despite how scary and powerful he was made to be, he was defeated by a normal punch from Saitama. And that was when the Monster King finally experienced fear for the first time. Next, we have Gale Wind and Hellfire Flame, who are ninja from the same village as Speedo Sound, Sonic, and Flashy Flash. I love the names of all these ninjas because they're always unnecessarily repetitive. Obviously a gale is a strong wind, and hopefully I don't have to explain why fire and flame is repetitive. I always get a kick out of these ninja names, I gotta say. Ninja are strong to begin with, so when they undergo monsterization, they become even more powerful than most monsters. In their dragon level forms, both Gale Wind and Hellfire Blaze don't even need their blades to fight. Their special strength is their speed and agility. Flashy Flash says the other S-Class heroes would have had trouble dealing with their speed. They can additionally use their respective elements Wind and Fire to further empower their attacks. Despite all this though, Flashy Flash manages to take them both out at the same time with a flashy slash. It is an epic moment and Flashy Flash says that the two lost because they were lacking in training. This was such an epic fight that Flashy Flash became one of my favorite heroes after it. Overgrown Rover is another dragon level monster and an executive member of the Monster Association. He is a six-eyed giant dog. He can shoot fiery energy blasts at his opponents from his mouth. These blasts are strong enough to incinerate stone and they can kill demon level monsters in a single shot. They can also destroy many floors of the Monster Association HQ. Even Garo's best attack at the time virtually had no effect against him. However, Saitama as usual is another story. He tells the dog to sit while he punches him. He's trying to train him rather than hurt him. Even though he wasn't really trying with the punch, Rover remembers his training. So, when Orochi wants Rover to attack Saitama, Rover runs away instead. Fubuki, Genos, Bang, and Bomb have trouble taking on Rover later, but manage to deal with him by telling him to sit. It seems like Saitama's training was very effective, so much so in fact that later Rover shrinks and Saitama mistakes him for a lost dog. Saitama takes him into A-City and even protects him from the security system. Eventually, Saitama gives him to A-Class heroes to take care of, which is hilarious since they have no idea that their pet dog is strong enough to put S-Class heroes to shame. Fuhrer Ugly is another executive member of the Monster Association, and the worst possible opponent that Sweet Mask could ever face. Aside from being strong, Fuhrer Ugly is surprisingly fast. Even though he's obese, he can quickly jump from wall to wall and has quick reflexes. Sweet Mask is even impressed by his speed and agility. Like other fugly monsters, to use Sweet Mask's term, Fuhrer Ugly became a monster because of resentment. His spiteful heart was filled with years of social difficulties, all rooted on his repulsive appearance. The uglier he became on the inside, the stronger he got when he monsterized. Fuhrer Ugly especially hates Sweet Mask because he is jealous of his good looks, and how he makes girls scream, but in a different way. In contrast, Sweet Mask can't even fight him, because when he sees a hideous face, he gets so distressed that he can't even move. Fuhrer Ugly can also make his cells mutate, and by doing so enter a bigger and stronger form. However, even in this form, he is no match for our elder, Bang, when he gets serious. Lastly, believe it or not, Fuhrer Ugly has been seen reading a book on how to become popular. It really makes you wonder how he would have turned out if he was born with Sweet Mask's looks and had his popularity. Next up we have Gums, the giant eating machine. He is a large ball with a mouth for a head. Gums is like the personification of the sin of gluttony, although I personally prefer when the sin of gluttony looks like a sexy 30 year old woman with magic powers. But realistically, a gluttonous, obese monster like Gums, who doesn't even talk but only consumes, is really the perfect image of gluttony. He is the monster equivalent of the S-Class hero Pig God. He uses his immense strength to overpower opponents and then eats and digests them. His teeth are strong enough to bite through metal with ease. Gums has elastic jaws and can swallow someone as large as Pig God in a single bite although Pig God fights his way out. Next, we have Homeless Emperor, another villain with a great backstory. He is an executive member of the Monster Association as well. He had it rough as a human. He had a company day job, his manager made him dance around naked during a welcome party for new hires. The next morning, 
he was accused of indecent exposure and was fired on the spot. He lost his job, lost his home, and spent his days camping in a park. And despite all this, when he saw the wide open sky above his head, his resentment felt small and petty. He realized that no building is as spacious as the earth itself. No interior lighting was as majestic as the skies. Humans are no more than specks of dust scattered on this incredible being we call our planet. Homeless Emperor viewed the Earth as his home. The Earth was a house larger than the greatest emperor's largest palace. According to Homeless Emperor, he was enlightened and saw the truth. He couldn't understand why people would tear themselves away from the perfect ecosystem that took Mother Earth millennia to construct. It was absurd to him that such fools, who lived alienated from nature, would look down on him. Finally, he said, I wanted to opt out of this ugly, claustrophobic, stupid grey world that humanity built from the heights of their stupidity. I wanted to return to nature, to commune heart and soul with Mother Earth, and the only real way to achieve that was to choose death. Then, when he came to that conclusion, that's when God apparently came to him, right before his eyes. This being agreed that humanity was foolish, but it was not time for Homeless Emperor to die. This god figure granted him power. Then, Homeless Emperor chose to use that power to free the planet from the parasite called humanity. Homeless Emperor has the body of a normal person, so he's not well suited for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. He is nonetheless quick and he uses that speed in combination with his energy balls to both avoid attacks and launch attacks. His energy balls are so strong that the S-Class Zombie Man has to admit that Homeless Emperor is overpowered. His energy balls are even strong enough to temporarily take out Bang. But the most interesting thing is that when he finally gets captured by Zombie Man, he gets a vision where he is in a meadow with a giant figure, and that figure is the being he calls God. Then, his God not only takes his powers away, but also takes his life. His body is then completely destroyed. This is probably one of the most mysterious moments in the series, although I can't talk about it in great detail because we still don't know a lot about this god figure. It definitely seems like he could be the strongest antagonist we've seen so far, if we consider how he can create at least dragon level monsters on his own, and how he can kill in such mysterious ways. Next we have executive member Evil Natural Water. As the name suggests, this monster is a moving mass of water. As a result, it can take any shape and move any way at will. Evil Natural Water acts on instinct and there is a rumor that it responds to the killing intent of those around it. This is why it doesn't respond to King because he is secretly terrified inside. Evil Natural Water is so difficult to control that even Psychos kept it locked up. One of its strongest moves is its high speed jet stream attack. It fires a jet of water that is quicker and more powerful than a bullet. This is by far one of the deadliest and scariest monsters you could deal with because of its speed, deadliness, and near invincibility. It even survives a punch from Saitama, but eventually Pig God succeeds in killing it by digesting it. It's actually hilarious, before it's digested, Evil Natural Water shoots all these holes into Pig God. Then, when told that he should go to the hospital immediately to heal himself, Pig God says that he'll stop by a ramen shop. First. Next up, we have executive member Black Sperm. You heard right, he's called Black Sperm, and when it comes to strength, he's no joke. In his Golden Sperm form, he's considered to be the most powerful monster in the association besides Monster King Orochi. He can split into multiple clones and merge the clones together to create more powerful versions of himself. His strongest version is Golden Sperm, which requires at least 10 trillion cells to create. In this form, Sweet Mask said that even if all the S-Class heroes ganged up on Golden Sperm, it would still be a difficult fight. He was strong and fast enough to overpower a weakened Tatsumaki, and he was completely immune to her psychic powers. He also became very arrogant and told all of the other heroes to form a line and wait for their turn to be killed. Eventually though, Garo defeats Golden Sperm while a single Black Sperm cell survives and becomes a pet along with no longer overgrown Rover. Kenzon Rat or Needlepoint Mouse is also a dragon level monster that appeared later in the story and attacked H City. It is a giant rat with giant spikes covering its entire body. It's like a Godzilla porcupine. It's likely that its major strength was its overwhelming size, but we didn't see it do too much. It was accidentally killed because it got caught in the crossfire of a fight between Saitama and Tatsumaki. Now let's talk about Garo, the former student of Bang. He is one of the most interesting and longest lasting villains in the series. Believe it or not, Garo is only 18 years old. He has been called the human monster and the hero hunter. 
I absolutely loved his backstory when I first heard it. When he was a kid, he watched a superhero show called Justice Man. Unlike most kids, Garo hated Justice Man and he was always rooting for the villains. He got upset because Justice Man would stop the villain from conquering the world every time. The bad guys try so hard but always get killed. To Garo, that's unfair and boring. The villains have hopes too and they're cooler. Garo feels bad because he always roots for them but they always lose. As he says popular guys winning and unpopular guys losing is a tragedy. So Garo decides that he won't lose to anyone and he'll become the strongest villain and change the story. After he manages to beat a large group of A-class heroes and escape from Genos, Bang, and Bomb, the Hero Association labels Garo a dragon level monster. By this time, Garo has awakened his half-monster form, with its red right eye and red hair. However, Garo just keeps getting stronger. He goes on to defeat S-class heroes like Puri Puri Prisoner and Darkshine. He even broke Darkshine's self-confidence in the process. Later, in his awakened monster form, he claims that his technique is disaster level god, implying that he has become a god level monster. The fact is, it is a self-proclaimed title, so we can't definitively label him as god level, but his powers are truly impressive at this point. Although he has super strength, speed, durability, and regeneration, his main strength really lies in his explosive rate of growth. His technique, which he calls Monster Calamity God Slayer Fist, allows him to quickly overpower S-Class heroes like Atomic Samurai, Pig God, Weekend Tatsumaki, and more. During his fight with Saitama, Garo undergoes more monstrous transformations. Nevertheless, he is powerless against Saitama. Garo reveals that he is actually fighting for world peace. He believes that absolute evil can establish real peace. While humanity is fearing Garo the monster, everyone's hearts will unite to survive. He feels like that is his duty, and he asks Saitama why he's a hero. And Saitama answers, after picking his nose, that it's a hobby. Garo freaks out at how unfair it is that someone with Saitama's strength has no strong sense of duty like he does. Then Saitama reveals that what Garo always wanted to be was a hero. He even had an image of an ideal hero inside him. Even though most of the heroes wanted to kill him, Saitama did not, and in the end he lets him get away. So, Garo lives to fight another day, but perhaps now he will begin to work toward becoming an ideal hero rather than an ideal monster. And here's two bonus dragon level monsters that didn't appear in the manga. There's the anime only dragon level monster Pluton, king of the underworld, who looks like a giant pig holding a trident. His screen time is very short. His motivation is that he wants to destroy humans because they waste their existence in gluttony and litter the earth with worthless objects. He is another Godzilla-esque giant monster that can destroy cities. However, Saitama quickly deals with him and all it takes is one punch. Then there's Energizer who appeared in an audiobook so we have no image of him. He can shoot energy blasts like other monsters we've seen. Energizer was pretty strong, Speedo Sonic needed Saitama's help to defeat him, so the two teamed up. And that is it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I truly think that villains are usually much more interesting than heroes, so I really enjoy doing the research on all of these different villains. Make sure to smash that like button if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it. Let me know what other One Punch Man videos you would like to see in the comments. A big thank you goes out to our patrons over on Patreon who help make videos like this one possible. I especially want to thank our Pro Hero Tier patrons, the one and only Gilgamesh, nothing but a fan, Jason Wilson, King Zeldris, and Angel Cruz, and our The One Tier patrons, the ones who stand atop all clans, Baby Ray, A17FFDP, Steven Ingrata, Alolan Atem, Maddie Mac 239 Makota Kuhn, and Keelon. And the patrons who transcend greatness itself, Reagan Harrison and Lord Nuxanor, the chosen few who have been acknowledged by Lord Twigo himself. If you enjoy our work, you can support more of it by going over to patreon.com slash anime uproar and becoming a patron today for as little as $1. If you do so, you'll get your name featured in future videos alongside these real life heroes right here, and you'll get access to our private patron only discord. So check out patreon.com slash anime uproar, link in the description if you're interested. And until next time, see ya, space cowboy.